Hello. For tonight's Grizzly Tale, I'm going to read you a story from Grizzly Tales for Gruesome Kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called... The Litterbug. In the olden days, people never wore trousers. They all wore tights. The reason for this was quite simple. A rat cannot crawl up the inside of a pair of tights, but a trouser leg offers the greatest temptation known to rats. And in the olden days, there were rats everywhere. So I ask you, if you had the choice between wearing tights or having a rat up your trousers, which would you choose? Rats in those days used to be enormous. They would slip out of their ditches or sewers at night and stuff themselves silly on all the rubbish that people threw into the street. The more they ate, the bigger and fatter they became. Some were as big as dogs and roamed the street in packs. If ever food became hard to find, they would attack babies in their prams and chew off their fingers. Then one day, a clever man called Mr. Dustbin realised that if he was ever to get rid of these ferocious rats, he would have to get rid of the rubbish first. So he invented a large bucket into which people could throw their rubbish. Then every Monday, he would collect these large buckets and take the rubbish to a secret place where the rats couldn't find it. The rats soon grew thin and hungry because they had nothing to eat. And in a very short time, all the rats in the world died out. Mr. Dustbin, however, grew rich and fat on all the money he made from collecting his buckets and retired to a very nice villa in Portugal where he sat by a swimming pool for the rest of his life and drank beer. All was well for a hundred years. Then Mr. Dustbin died, and with him died the memory of the rats. People had forgotten how awful it had been living with those vicious packs of slinky grey nibblers, and they slipped back into their old ways. Litter appeared on the streets again. Empty cans, greasy fish and chip wrappings, old newspapers and broken glass bottles once again lay in festering heaps by the side of the road. The difference, though, was that this time there were no rats left to eat the rubbish. They had all died because of Mr. Dustbin's cunning invention. So the piles of litter just grew bigger. In six weeks, city centres throughout the land were overshadowed by vast amounts of plastic food cartons and scrunched up sweet papers, waves of soggy cardboard boxes, mouldy food and rotting shoes sloshed out of the cities into the countryside. And it was not long before a national emergency was announced. Great Britain was being buried under a topsoil of stinking rubbish. School children were given a shovel and a wheelbarrow and told to clean up the mess. Lessons were cancelled. Classes spent their days rushing to the seaside with wheelbarrows full of rotting waste and dumping the contents into the sea. But it was all to no avail. The litter mounting kept on growing and all because of one person. Her name was Bunty Porker. She was as large as a double-decker bus, and to all who knew her, it was obvious why. She never stopped eating. Thirteen packets of cereal, five pounds of cheese, sixty-four slices of bread, and a lorry load of chocolate buttons for breakfast. Eleven packets of crisps for elevenses, and another twelve for twelvesies. Then lunch. This was when the serious eating of the day began for Bunty. Aeroplanes from China flew in her first course. One thousand packets of rice, which she would boil up and serve with a knob of butter on top. 
This was followed by a vat of frozen peas, as many turkey burgers as she could eat in ten minutes, generally about 200, and a microwave full of chips. Pudding was simple. She went down to the local ice cream factory and ate it. At four o'clock in the afternoon, Bunty always felt peckish, so she would make herself some sandwiches. As many as would fit on the kitchen table was usually sufficient, but more often than not, she would break into a crate of biscuits and devour those too. Three hours later, it was supper time. Takeaways were her favourite. She would order twelve Indian curries and ten Chinese set meals for six, then pop down to the local hamburger restaurant for a milkshake and twenty-seven half-pounders with double helpings of everything. And once in bed, a cup of warm milk and a shortbread biscuit to aid digestion. It was not the vast quantity of food which Bunty ate that was the problem. The litter mountain grew because everything she ate was wrapped in plastic or came in a box and she had to dispose of the wrappings somewhere. She made herself a mega large Macintosh with extra deep pockets. During the day she filled these pockets with her litter. Come nightfall she slipped onto the streets and emptied her foul cargo into other people's front gardens, into duck ponds in the park, into bus shelters and shop doorways. Bunty was a litter lout of the most ginormous proportions. It was not long before the litter mountain was as tall as two mountains. It stretched up through the clouds as far as the eye could see. On the ground its effect was devastating. Lakes disappeared, hills were flattened, cities came to a standstill as the streets clogged up. The country was quite literally a wasteland. People were trapped in their houses and animals buried underground. Bunty was the only person who ever went outside. She was the only person big enough to wade through swamps of old nappies and black banana skins. She was the only person who could stand the foul pong that hung over the land like a damp blanket. Then the insects came. To them the pong was heaven. It was like waking up in the morning and smelling toast downstairs. The insects couldn't help themselves. One whiff of the litter mountain and they were drawn towards it. They came from all over the world. Fat flies from America, wolf spiders from Australia, mosquitoes from Africa and big black bugs the size of 50 pence pieces from Europe. It was the Queen who first decided that enough was enough. She rang up the Prime Minister in the middle of the night. Uh, yes, said the Prime Minister sleepily as he sat up in bed. Queen here, said the Queen. What are you going to do about the rubbish? I can't get out to walk the corgis. Oh, your Majesty, said the Prime Minister. I had no idea. I'll call a cabinet meeting straight away and we'll draw up a plan of action. Yes, you do that, said the Queen. But hurry, they're only little dogs, and they can't hang on much longer. Yes, of course, said the Prime Minister. I'll do everything I can. The Cabinet decided that there was only one way to deal with the problem. Catch Bunty. That night, the army was called in. 20,000 troops marched well, or rather squelched, into London. The commanding officer was a red-faced man with a bristly moustache. His name was Colonel Buffy. Leave it all to me, Prime Minister, he shouted. My troops have been fully camouflaged. We've stuck bits of litter in our hats. This bunty girlie will never see us coming. We'll have her locked up within the hour. Meanwhile, Bunty was not aware that any of this was happening. She was busy stuffing the pockets of her mega-large Macintosh with empty baked bean tins, ready for that night's litter drop. Bunty left her house as the church clock was striking midnight. The moon was hidden behind a motionless cloud. 
She belly flopped into the sticky black river that flowed outside her front door and swam down the road to the foot of the litter mountain. As she heaved herself out of the slime, she heard a rustling behind her. She turned to look, but all she could see was litter. She carried on up the mountain. There it was again, that same noise. But it wasn't just behind her now, it was all around. She peered again through the darkness to see what it was, and this time she definitely saw the rubbish moving. There was something underneath it, trying to push its way out. Over here, men, whispered Colonel Buffy. There she is. The Colonel pointed at the huge shadowy figure of Bunty standing on the rubbish heap. You all know what to do. Form a circle round her, then close in and catch her. Um, sir, said a weedy soldier, don't you think she's a bit big for us, sir? Nonsense, said the Colonel. She's a little girly, no problem. Then he barked, forward men. Bunty was watching the litter mountain for any further signs of movement. Everything had suddenly gone very quiet and still. The rustling had stopped. I must have imagined it, she said to herself. Then she turned and continued climbing. Suddenly, the air was filled with screaming and shouting. There were soldiers everywhere carrying nets and waving sticks. Litter flew into the air as their heavy boots crashed down the slope towards her. More in terror than bravery, Bunty stood her ground. She was quickly surrounded and held tight by Colonel Buffy's men. Bunty Porker, said the Colonel. You're a litterbug. You're a menace. You're coming with me. Bunty looked around at the camouflage faces. 20,000 soldiers didn't seem that many to her. She turned back to the Colonel. Well, actually, she said, I'd rather not if you don't mind. Then she swung her massive arms around her head until she looked a little bit like a helicopter and flattened a lot of them. Of course, she said to herself as she plodded on up the mountain, those soldiers must have made that rustling sound and the moving litter was them crawling towards me. How stupid of me to be scared. Well, at least I can dump my baked bean tins in peace now. But Bunty was wrong. The soldiers had been as quiet as mice. Something else had made the rustling sound. Something else had been burrowing away underneath the mountain, trying to get out. Do you remember the rats? The ones that grew into monster rats from eating all the rubbish? The ones that nibbled babies' fingers? They had all died out, hadn't they? But Bunty's litter mountain had attracted a different kind of visitor. Do you remember the big black bugs from Europe? As Bunty reached the top of the mountain, she felt something shift under her feet. A long, sharp wire pricked her ankle. She jumped backwards. It wasn't a wire. It couldn't be. It was twitching, and it was pushing its way out through the side of the mountain. It looked exactly like a feeler on the top of a beetle's head, but that wasn't possible. It was over 30 feet long. No bug was that big. Bunty's heart nearly stopped. Unless, unless the big black bugs from Europe have been eating all the rubbish and have grown into giant bugs, she screamed. The mountainside opened up in front of her. Two enormous black pincers flashed past her head. Four leathery wings beat the air and knocked her off her feet. Six hairy legs scuttled out of the hole. Bunty sat there with her cheeks wobbling and her mouth open. The litterbug was hungry. With one enormous gloop, the giant bug sucked up three tons of litter and licked his lips. Bunty Porker didn't stand a chance. She disappeared along with all the rest of the rubbish. The litterbugs soon ate all the litter. 
and Bunty's mountain was reduced to a mere compost heap within a month. When the rubbish ran out, the litterbugs flew away in search of food elsewhere. But people had learnt their lesson. They never threw litter onto the street again. They always put it in a dustbin, as Mr. Dustbin had taught them to all those years before. So if you ever drop litter, do watch out for the bugs. They're never far behind you. Ha 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 ha!